So we've been studying the book of Psalms. And when we look at the book of Psalms, it's divided into how many different sections? Five different sections. And Daniel, can you tell me what they go with? What books of the Bible they go with? What's that? I don't know. They... Oh, I'm sure you know. It's, it's a little bit hard, hard, but they court go with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Yeah. So the, there are five books. Each book corresponds <laughs> with the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and in that order. Dennis, how many people edited the Book of Psalms? Well, it's the past. There's one of the people that wrote it. Would be like 30. Very good. Very good. You're back there acting like I'm not picking on you and no. asking you. No, the question that you asked him, uh, I got quite sad. Have you both heard? Oh, is that what it was? First five books. Okay. No, but we know that the book of Psalms is divided into the five sections. Book 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. They correspond with the Pentateuch. There were three main auditors, editors, David being one of them. We've gone through already looking at one of the sections in the book of Psalms. And what I mean by that is basically we look at what is probably the what I consider the trilogy when it comes to the book of Psalms. Psalm 22, 23, 24. And they reveal to us what, what do they reveal to us about Christ? And, there's three offices, prophet in Psalm 22, priest in Psalm 23, and king in Psalm 24. When we look at Psalm 24, it is the oldest passage that describes in detail the crucif crucifixion of any kind, much less the crucifixion of Christ, 500 years at least before crucifixion was even invented. So moving forward today, we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 42 and Psalm 43. We're going to spice it up a little bit and look at two chapters today. Is there anything when you get there that sticks out about Psalm chapter 42? And you don't have to look, you shouldn't have to look far to notice it. Is it the first, is it the first one in the second book? Very good, Brother Dennis. It is the very first psalm of book two. So when it comes to the comp um, compilation of the book of Psalms by the three editors, the second editor, well, obviously you are looking in your Bible. If you look in your Bibles, it says it too. No, it does. That's, that's why it's there, it's to help us all. Because I don't always remember everything, and guess what? Now you guys have a way, if you ever want to look over it, you have it in front of you, so you can go back. But it, that is exactly right. It is the very first psalm in the second book of Psalms. So when it comes to book two, uh, book two, this is Psalm 42 starting it off. And if we look at Psalm, the heading of Psalm chapter 42, to whom was it written? Or for whom was it written? The sons of Korah. When we look into the book of Psalms, we have to keep in mind that it, was, it is the Jewish psalm book. It was written for the Levitical choir there in the temple. It was meant to be something permanent. And there were three groups of the main group of singers. And one of them were the sons of Korah. And if we want to look at the leader of the sons of the core, when it comes to who was the person in charge of them, we would find that it was Heman. And we find that in 1 Chronicles 6.33. If someone would please find 1 Chronicles 6.33. And someone else, 1 Chronicles 25 and verse 1. First Chronicles 6.33, First Chronicles 25, and verse 1. And these are they that waited with their children of the sons of the Kohathites, even the singer, mm -hmm. the son of Joel, the son of Shema. Okay. Kohathites referred to the sons of Korah, and Heman was there. 
What about 1 Chronicles 25 and verse 1? So we have the leaders of the three groups mentioned in 1 Chronicles 25 and verse 1. So we're going to look at Psalm chapter 42, and just to spice things up as well, we're going to be looking at Psalm 43, but we're going to start with Psalm 42. And I'll go ahead and read Psalm 42, because if we're going to study a passage, we ought to read it and at least see what it states. So Psalm chapter 42. As the heart pants after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for, thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they uh, continue to say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan, and of the Hermonites, Hermonites from the hill of Mizar, deep calls unto deep at the noise of, the, of thy water spouts. All the waves and not billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command that his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night, and a song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the help of my countenance and my God. So we step back as we have done in weeks past. What do you think are some key words that are found within Psalm 42? What are some words that might describe this psalm in a nutshell, or most of it in a nutshell? And we can go with that, but what are some key words that would pop out? Not verses at this point, but key words. My soul thirsts for God, for the God. So, if we wanted to pick one word out of that phrase, it might be one word that would sum that up. God. So, God's in there quite a bit. So, God would be a key word. What else might be in that passage? Hope. Hope. So we're talking about somebody who's looking for hope. Is there anything else? My soul. So soul would be a word that might describe it. Because we're talking about the individual soul. He's questioning, is everything right with him? What? He's vexed. He's troubled. Is there anything else that might pop out? My tears. So we can go with tears. Like I said, there are no right or wrong answers in this. We're just trying to sum up this passage in a nutshell. I put down praise because at the same time, he wants to praise his God. He praises him. He is his rock and his refuge. Does anybody else have anything else they want to add at this point for key words? So loving kindness, so we're talking about God's loving kindness toward him. He's his rock, he shows his loving kindness, he takes care of him. So now let's move on. We've gone short, but we'll go a little bit broader. What about key phrases? What phrases within this passage would sum up Psalm 42? 
Hope thou in God, because that's where he's placed in his hope. That's where he's placed in his trust. My God, my rock. Anybody else have anything, any other key phrases they want to add? Hold my weight, and I feel the God over me. His billows have gone over him. And no, I put down, my soul thirsteth for God. Because really, when we look at this passage in a nutshell, he's thirsting after God. He's troubled, he's vexed, but yet he's questioning, and he's trying to go after God. He knows that God is his rock and his refuge. I also put, I pour out my soul, because that's exactly what he's doing throughout this entire passage. He is pouring out the soul, whether he's questioning himself, whether he's staying and praising God for being his rock, his salvation, he is rejoicing at the love and God, kindness that God has shown him. But he is pouring out his soul throughout this entire song. Does anybody have any other key phrases that they would want to throw out? And his loving kindness. Now, if we move on to key verses, brother Eli, you've already said one and two, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so my soul panteth after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So these two verses could describe Psalm 42 in a nutshell. Does anybody else have anything else that they might, any other verses that might describe the song in a nutshell, or summer, summarize it? Verse 11. You want to read verse 11? So he's questioning the reason he's troubled, but yet at the same time, he's placing his hope in God. And in a sense, praising God. He knows that he's there. Amen. Are there any other verses that might describe Psalm 42 in a nutshell? I personally went with verses 11 and verse 5. Verse 5 states, Why are thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Going right along with verse 11. He's taking into consideration that his soul is in turmoil, but he knows where he's going to place his hope. Anybody else want to add anything before we move on to Psalm 43? Okay, we'll take a look at Psalm 43. It's a little bit shorter. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto, the, unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O oh God, my God. Why art thou cast down? O oh, my soul, and why art thou disquietest within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the help of my countenance and my God. So we're going to go through the same routine that we just did with Psalm 42. What might be some key words that pop out in Psalm 43 to describe it? Praise. So praise. questioning himself. He still have people coming against him, but yet he knows where his hope lies. Does anybody else have any other key words for Psalm 43 before we move on to the key phrases? God is my strength. Okay, so let's move on to key phrases. So God is my strength. So we're talking about God is his strength. What might be some other key phrases that we could use? 
Two. Two. Well, now we need more than one word, brother. We need several. It says, uh, send out thy light and thy truth. So send out thy light and thy truth. For me personally, I use the phrases, judge me, plead my cause, and deliver my soul. Does anybody else have anything else they want to add to this before we move on to key verses? Because we're going somewhere. Okay, let's move on to key verses. What might be some key verses of Psalm 43 that would sum up this entire psalm in a nutshell? Whether it's one, whether it's multiple. So bring me into thy holy hill and thy tabernacle. What verse is that, brother? That is number three. Verse three. That was also one of mine as well. Are there any other verses that might summarize this song in a nutshell? <coughs> verse five. What does five, verse five say? Where thou cast down, O my soul, where thou hast glided within me. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is a health in my countenance and my God. Does anybody else have any other verses before we move on? Okay, go ahead and read verse 4, brother. Then do I go unto the heart of God, unto God my exceedingly joy, yea, upon the heart do I praise thee, O God, my God. Yes, sir. Now, I'm not going to belittle it belittle it in any means, but I want to go somewhere and we have a lot to cover yet. But I always love to see where the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament. And that is right there in your notes. We're not going to read this, but uh, verse-wise, but Psalm 42, verse 5 is believed to be referenced in Matthew 26, verse 38, and also Mark 14, 34. 42, 5 just simply states, Why are thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquietest within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. If you would look in those verses in the New Testament, it's Jesus Christ on the cross, stating, Why art thou cast out on my soul? So if you want to look at that at a later time, you can. But we're going somewhere today. And this is, we, and if we look at Psalm 42 and 43, it is believed that originally they were one song. They were not divided, but rather they were united, and they were one song. And we look in the old Hebrew manuscripts, Psalm 42 and 43 are all are joined together. Why is there a division? Because there was a nice monk many, many moons ago that divided the book, the entire Bible, into verses and chapters. I'm not saying that the chapters and the divisions, the divisions of the chapters, the numbers of the chapters, and the number of the verses and how they're divided. I'm not saying that they are the inspired word of God, um, Spurgeon. Um, rebuked it, being saying we need to be careful, but we have the inspired word of God in front of us. The words are inspired, the chapters and divisions aren't. I don't consider that a hang up. What it does help us, though, is to know that they were one song. So when we're looking at it, the book of Psalms and study it out, Psalm 42 and 43 at one time were joined together. They weren't divided. And when we look at Psalm 42 and 43, it's as if they bleed one into the other. Why? Because they were meant to be one song. Who were they written to? Who were they written to be sung by? And we have that in the beginning, and you guys all refer to uh, who? Psalm 42, David. It's not written by David, but who was it written for? The sons of Korah. The sons of Korah. But who were the sons of Korah? That is the big question going in, and that adds so much light to this passage. It's not even funny. When we look at the sons of Korah, do we all know who Korah was? If we go back to the Old Testament, there was a rebellion that was led against Moses. Yes, it is, brother. Korah led a rebellion against Moses. And God told Moses and Aaron to separate the people, stay far away from them, because he was going to do something. And God opened up the earth when the rebellion came and swallowed up Korah and those that followed him. Now how does that help us? Um, let's go ahead and read Numbers chapter 27, 1 through 3 and verse 11. If someone would please
please find Numbers 27, 1 through 3, and verse 11. Numbers 27, verses 1 through 3, and also verse 11. Okay, Numbers 27. I'll go ahead and read it. Then came the daughters of Zelophiah, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Makar, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of his daughters, Mahala, Noah, Hagla, and Milcah, and Tarzah. And they stood before Moses, and before Eleazar the priest, and before the princes of all the congregation, by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no sons. Verse 11. And if his father have no brother, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his kinsmen, that is next to him, of his family, and ye shall possess it, and shall be unto the children of Israel a statue of judgment as the Lord commanded. So here we have a descendant of Korah, who had no sons. All he had were daughters. And verse 11 states that if he had no sons, then the entire inheritance of the father went to the eldest daughter. So we have the sons of Korah living on through the daughters of this man. Now, when we go a little bit farther, we have to understand that Korah was a Levite and a direct descendant of Levi. We find that in Numbers chapter 16, 1 through 11. What do we know about the Levites when it comes to the tabernacle? What were their responsibilities? What were their roles? What's that? They helped the priest. But how did they help the priest? That's exactly right, brother. The Levites were the unsung heroes of the tabernacle. They were the ones who set up the tabernacle, set up the furniture. They were the ones that took it down. And when they were traveling in the wilderness, they were the ones that were carrying it all. They got the burdensome work of the work. They were not the ministers. They were not the ones who took the shoe bread. They were not the ones that went before the Ark of the Covenant and offered the sacrifice. They were not the big prominent man standing on the brazen altar offering the sacrifice, they were behind the scenes. They did the brunt work. I don't disagree. Just where I'm going, that's 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 a side to it, brother, at this point. It's a side to it. The important thing to remember about the sons of Korah were they were Levites and they were responsible for carrying the Ark of the Covenant. The pieces of furniture, setting them up, taking them down, setting up the tent. They were the ones that did all the brunt work. Well, Korah got done with this, and he thought that they should be in charge. Why, why, why should Moses minister? Why should Aaron minister? And we do all the work. That might sound like some people in some churches today. You know, if I don't get recognized, then what am I doing? Why do they get all the recognition? No one even knows, but I do. This was basically the idea behind the sons of poor, and that's why poor led the rebellion. Now, why is that important? Because we're running out of time, I'm going to make this a little bit quick, and we won't read all the verses, but you have them all there. Guess who was also a direct descendant of Levi? So poor was a direct descendant of Levi, but who else was the man he came against? Go to one more brother. Moses. Aaron, Moses, and Mary were also direct descendants of Levi. Levi. And Moses was seen as the prominent man that led the people out of Israel. Aaron was the high priest. 
Miriam was a prophetess, and poor Korah, who was also a direct descendant, had to do all the grunt work. Why should he do all the grunt work? The other thing that makes it a little bit interesting is when we start studying out the descendants of the ancestors, Moses' dad and Korah's dad were brothers. So what does that make Moses to Korah? A first cousin. It would be no different than me, my brother, and John and Ash having a squabble over different things. Why are they put in charge of that? Why shouldn't we do it? You know, somebody that's really, really close to us. You know, somebody that maybe you grew up with, that you knew your entire life, you knew them inside and out. How come they get the spotlight and we have to do all the heavy work? So that was the squabble here with the sons of Korah. And God opened up the earth and swallowed them up. But yet, we get in Psalm 41 and verse 1, and these people, this family, the side of Moses that squabbled and said, why should we do all the hard work and labor? We finally find them into a place where as the heart penneth after the water broke, so my soul thirsts after God. You know, it's not a matter of being the prominent person seen at the front, but rather they come to the point where they realize that it's not a matter of name if I'm in front. What's important is I need to chase after God. And that phrase, as the heart pans after water broke, that shows us something. That deer is being chased. He has trouble chasing them. Something after him. If you're being chased, or if you're in fear, or you have a lot of worry and stress in your life, how many of you get hungry? Maybe not so much. In fact, if you get too stressed and fearful, you don't have an appetite at all. But you do get thirsty. That is one thing that never leaves us, is that thirst. In fact, we can get so thirsty for something, you ever have it be so thirsty that even a cup of water won't quench it? You have cup after cup, and it still just does not touch it. And we know that there's even a thirst so much, even in turmoil and stress, stress with Christ being on the cross, that you can get so dried out that your tongue feels like it's cleaving to your mouth. You need to drink water. You don't want food. You're stressed, you're in turmoil, but you don't want a big old steak. You don't want french fries. You don't want a big old burger. What you need is a drink of water. And that's what we find in Psalm 42 and verse 1. We have somebody under great stress, turmoil, and that all they're trying to do is to get to the waters of God, to get a drink of the water that will end all every, um, that will quench every thirst that is out there. And when we look at Psalm 42, and even a couple of 43, this individual is tormented. He is in turmoil. He's in pain and anguish. And he says his soul is cast down. And he starts questioning. You know, sometimes when we're in pain and turmoil, and it seems like the whole world maybe is not falling around, you know, sometimes the best thing we need to do is introspection. Because there's that phrase I've seen a long time ago. And I like it, maybe I shouldn't, but I like it anyhow. It stated that sometimes the reason that bad things happen to you is because you did something stupid. You no, know, we need in those times say, God, has my heart been pure this whole time? Have I done anything to cause this anguish, this pain upon myself? Have I displeased you in any way? Have I committed sin? Is there anything in my life? Lord, I want to chase you and I have to want to uh, be with you, but I know what Psalm 24 states, who can ascend into the hill of the Lord and who can stand in his holy place? Only he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. God, I'm going through this right now. Are my hands clean? Are my heart, is my heart pure? Has it been that way? Am I deceived in any way? Because we all know that the heart is deceitfully wicked. And who can know? God, I am hungering and chasing after you. Lord, make sure that I am pure and holy before you. That I may attain the prize at the end, which is to be in your presence. As we go through Psalm 42 and 43. What is the ultimate goal of this individual here? To find out how he can reach God. It's not like his forefather, Korah, who said he wanted to be at the forefront. 
He thought he should be at the front. He should be the scene figure. Why does Aaron get all the publicity? Why does his sons get to minister in the temple before God? Why do they get to go into the presence of God once a year to offer the sin sacrifice? But these people are here in Psalm 42 and 43 are crying out, God, make sure that I am pure and holy before you because I want to chase after you. I want to see you. And as we go down through, it says, my tears have been my meat day and night. He's not been hungry for anything else. He's not had a physical hunger, but rather his tears have been what's feeding him. God, I want to know you. Where are you? That it states in verse 4 that he's pouring out his soul. And then in verse 5, he questions, why are thou cast down? And I know I'm going a little bit faster because I'm running out of time. But when we look at verse 3 as well, and I want to touch on this as well. When I was studying for this, they stated that Psalm 42 is a psalm from pathos to praise. What do they mean by that? It's a psalm of self-pity. If we look at Psalm um, verse 3, while my tears have been my uh, meat day and night, they are continually saying to me, where is thy God? It's self-pity, you know. They're saying to me, where is thy God? But it's almost like a woe is me, woe is me. My tears are my meat day and night. There's nothing else. You know, sometimes if we're not careful, we can allow uh, ourselves to get in that place of self-pity. And what happens when we get into that place of self-pity? Oftentimes, we get our eyes off of God. And what happens when we get our eyes off of God? We sink. The best example we have for this Christian walk is probably Peter walking on the water with Jesus Christ. You know, storms of life are going to come. It's an inevitable. I keep telling them at work, if it wouldn't be for Bill, I wouldn't be here anymore. Discover Bill, electric Bill. You know, there's things in life we've got to deal with. And issues arise. Sometimes they come from um, just stupid stuff that happens that we have no control over. Storm comes, blows the roof off our house, and we have no idea how we're going to pay for it. Other times... Friends betray us. Other times, even like Moses, somebody that should have been close in the family, first cousin, somebody close to us in the family who should not come against us, is coming against us. And they cause us trouble and woe. But the image of Peter walking over the water shows us that no matter what comes our way, if we keep our eyes on Christ and never forget where he is and just keep going for him, you know, it doesn't matter what storm is around us. There's always going to be a storm. There's always going to be trouble. There's always going to be problems. And there's always going to be a bill to pay. Even after you're dead, there's going to be a bill to pay because someone's got to bury you. But there's always going to be problems. But as long as we can keep our focus on Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter come our way. But when we get caught up in self-pity and gloom and woe, and I'm not saying we don't get at times where it just gets overwhelming, but we still need to realize where our rock is, just like this author did. And that is Jesus Christ. It's in those times of self-pity that we can cry out to God and say, this is going wrong. There's nothing wrong with telling God your problems. He already knows it, but he wants to hear from us anyhow. There is nothing wrong with that. But if we get ourselves and our minds, even in a state of prayer, we can do that. Get ourselves and our minds so fixated on the problem and the situation that while we we're praying, our eyes are far from God. We're talking to him, but... We're so focused and wrapped up in the situation. If God wanted to speak, we can't even hear him because we're just so overwhelmed. If we go down to verse 7, deep calls unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. The deep unto deep is just that trouble. That it just piles up, it piles up. It's piling on one after another. It's the best thing I can think of is Job. One servant comes, and guess what? Enemy came and killed all your sheep. Guess what? Fire came from heaven, devoured all your cattle. And I could have it wrong, but it does happen to different things. All of a sudden, somebody else comes. Hey, guess what? Wind came, knocked down your entire house. They killed all your family. Even worse news, your wife is still alive. It didn't take her. 
She's going to cause you trouble and grief and everything else down the road. Just you wait. And we know the story of Job. But the truth of the matter is, and that could go for any spouse. But regardless, it's just all it is is trouble piling on one after another after another. And what happens when things pile up one after another after another after another? It adds to our focus getting off of Jesus Christ. Because we're so fixated with that glob and that mess that's in front of us. That somehow we have to deal with this. We don't know how we're going to pay for our room. We don't know how this. Because all of a sudden the stove, the washer, and the dryer, and the fridge is out of freon. And now we need all new appliances. And this is happening, and the car is going, and it's used in oil, or this and this. No, anything in life, it just seems to pile. And it happens. But it doesn't matter how high the pile goes. We need to remember even the words of the author in Psalm 43 and 44. Keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Because it's in those times when things just keep piling up, piling up, piling up, that the devil sends somebody by. And he's like, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Job had three friends come by that didn't help him out at all. Even it, and they can even be in church. Why do Pete, God keep sinners in church? Because even the devil needs a hand to use. He can't use a Christian, so he needs somebody else. So the devil will keep him there. And this person comes in. Even maybe this one who's supposed to be your best friend comes in and says, well, you're... But we see that even, and I was trying to find it, why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? And we find in verse 3 of Psalm 43. In verse 1, Judge me, O God, and please my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. No, it's not just the trouble of life, but it's those that come against us. And when we look at Psalm 42 and 43, we find an individual who falls on his face before God, saying, God, I'm hungry and thirsting for you. I need you to come by and touch me. This is happening in life. This is happening in life. And there seems to be no end. You are my rock, and there's nowhere else I can go. The enemy comes in. They come in, and they try to overcome me. They discourage me. They, try, they tell falsehoods about me. They go spreading rumors. Because just remember, sometimes a listening ear is also a speaking mouth. And all those things come upon this individual. But they get from the point of self-pity and crying out for all their trouble. And we get to the Psalm of, end of Psalm 43, where it states, Why are thou cast down on my soul, and why are thou disquietest within me? Basically, why are you doing this? There's no reason for it. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. When we look at this passage, we have the sons of Korah. Those family members that were part of the, that led a rebellion against Moses. But all of a sudden it's saying, it's no longer about being in the forefront. I don't need to be the guy in the front. All that matters right now is, I need my God. Trouble is coming in from all sides. It seems like I'm surrounded and overwhelmed. God, is this my fault? Is this my doing? Or is it someone else's? God, reveal it to me. But whether it's my fault, whether it's somebody else's, you're the only one I can place my trust in. You're the only one I can hope in. Place my hope in. And you're the only one I need. And despite what happens in life, despite how I feel, because there are times we come into church and we can be so overwhelmed by whether it's the events of the days, the week, or just life troubles in general, that we just can't shake them. But there needs to be that place where our eyes stay fixated on God and say, you know what, it doesn't matter what my troubles are, I am going to praise you regardless. I think it was Casting Crown years and years ago that did the song, I will praise you in the storm. No matter, no matter what life's trouble brings our way, whether it's now, whether it's later, if we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, 
He will always be our rock, our shepherd, our shield, our strong tower that we can run into. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. And in Psalm 43, it also reveals to us it go, is the individual going from the self, um, from questioning themselves in Psalm 42, placing everything in God's hands in Psalm 43. Anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point in time? You know, uh, Moses, the reason why God was Moses is a man. So he knew he was humble, and he knew that he could take care of him. For Aaron and, and his sister, they can't attack Moses. They could handle it. But Moses, he could handle it. He didn't cry out before the Lord. He might destroy them. But God, God they, they would not be able to handle what Moses did. That's why God put the right person in his place. Just like the preacher. God put who he wants there and, and who he wants to be as a teacher or whatever, you know. God puts you where he wants you. Absolutely. He is the one that raises up kings and he's the one that takes down kingdoms. Yeah. Anybody else have anything else they want to say? If not, let us bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high and that there is none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move however he pleases, Lord. Knowing the song leader and the musicians, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, anoint the song, anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word. And may we have our hearts and our minds plowed, that they would be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives. That we would be even farther transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ, and be drawn closer to you than ever before. That our walk would grow, Lord. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.